Hello, welcome uh, to Brumbury Evangelical Church to our afternoon service. It's good to have you with us. Hopefully uh, you're able to join us here at 4.30 uh, when we can all get together, although we're still separate, we're kind of worshipping uh, at the same time, even if not in the same place. Uh, after our time together, uh, we'll be having a coffee over a uh, Zoom uh, and you find uh, information on how to connect uh, with us all on the website. So it'd be really lovely to see you at that uh, straight after the service. We're going to sing our first hymn. So let's uh, sing together. The words will be on the screen. Uh, please do sing your heart out and if it helps, stand. Why not? Let's sing together. to uh, read now from uh, from the Bible. We've been working our way through 
Jeremiah. We're up to Jeremiah chapter 20. Uh, so we're not going through chapter by chapter through Jeremiah. It's an enormous book, uh, but we're making our way through various key uh, stages along the way, getting a feel for what uh, Elijah has been going through, his message, uh, and obviously what that means for us today. So uh, our reading then is uh, Jeremiah chapter 20, just the first six verses, though we'll make our way through the whole chapter later on. Now Pasha, son of Immer, the priest in charge of the temple of the Lord, heard what Jeremiah was prophesying. So he arrested Jeremiah the prophet and had him whipped and put in stocks at the Benjamin gate of the Lord's temple. The next day, when Pasha finally released him, Jeremiah said, Pasha, the Lord has changed your name. From now on, you are to be called the man who lives in terror. For this is what the Lord says, I will send terror upon you and all your friends, and you will watch as they are slaughtered by the swords of the enemy. I will hand the people of Judah over to the king of Babylon. He will take them captive to Babylon or run them through with the sword. And I will let your enemies plunder Jerusalem. All the famed treasures of the city, the precious jewels and gold and silver of your kings will be carried off to Babylon. As for you, Pasha, you and all your household will go as captives to Babylon. There you will die and be buried. You and all your friends to whom you prophesied that everything would be all right. Well, that's God's word. Uh, we'll come back to it in a little while. We're going to uh, pray before we do that. Let's uh, Let's come to God in prayer. Our great God and Father, we thank you for the book of Jeremiah uh, and the, indeed the sorrow that he went through, that what it means to go through uh, dark days of suffering. Um, and you know us, Lord, you know our situation and how uh, some in the church are going through dark days, have been through dark days and uh, can expect dark days to come. But in all these things, Lord, we thank you that you are sovereign, you are our great holy God, you you sit on the throne over the universe and all kings and governments uh, are accountable to you. We thank you that there is nothing uh, that happens in this entire creation that is unknown to you. And, and Lord, even in your glory and untouchable wonder, yet we thank you that we come to a God who knows what human suffering feels like. We thank you that we have an advocate before the very throne in heaven, the Lord Jesus himself, who has suffered in his humanity, who knows what it feels like to, to experience grief and to see sickness and disease, uh, to, uh, to see such human suffering and sorrow. Indeed, his own death, a reminder of just how brutal uh, people can be to one another. And so we thank you that he is now our great high priest, uh, the, the priest who has once the sacrifice is now our great God and King and Lord. Uh, we can only bring you our thanks. We can only bring you our, our worship. We contribute nothing to our salvation. In th your Son you have given us the sacrifice. You give us uh, life. You give us uh, a high priest. You give us hope of eternity. And in him... You give us great and precious promises for help in time of need. So our, our God and Father, we cry out to you as your people uh, for, uh, for mercy, for help. There are people across this country, across the world, who now are suffering. People crying out for some kind of answer, some kind of meaning. Lord, have mercy. We pray for our government uh, with such important, huge, the uh, weighty things to deal with. Lord, yours is the eternal government and we pray as the government rests on the shoulders of the Lord Jesus Christ, he would be gracious and cause our own uh, UK government to act with great wisdom, sensitivity, with compassion. Uh, so many things to balance, Lord. We pray then for ourselves that as we as we go through our lives, as we go through this week, 
help us to to do so in a way that is honouring to you, that is making you known. And in our private thoughts, in our homes, in our, our, our time with our families, we pray that in every way we would be bringing glory to you, giving honour to you, and that you would be pleased as you work in us and through us. May we grow in our knowledge of you, our experience of you, even in these strange uh, and turbulent times. And so we pray for ourselves as we come to, uh, to Jeremiah uh, and think about these, uh, these difficult days that he went through and the, the rejection and oppression that, that he suffered. Uh, help us then to understand how we might uh, respond well to the suffering that comes our way. Lord God, work in us, we pray. Give us ears to hear now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. If you want to open your Bible again then to uh, Jeremiah chapter 20, we're going to take uh, another look at uh, what we've been looking at there. Now, uh, as I was alluding to in our uh, prayer there, people go through hard times in all sorts of ways. Uh, Sometimes there's a kind of grin and bear it. uh, For other people, there's a protest and a rage. Um, uh, there used to be a kind of a British stiff upper lip, you know, bulldog attitude, but I, I think we're kind of a bit more complex than that these days. Uh, but what about Christians? When Christians go through difficult days and hard times and, and the things that we do, and um, well, for some you might just think, well, you know, you need to keep your head down. The Lord knows what he's doing. You've got to get on with things or uh, all things work uh, for the good of those who love him. So just trust and it will all be OK which is fine you can kind of know some of these things in your head as a uh, as an intellectual um, uh, knowledge but um, your heart can can not quite agree uh, what we're going to see here in Jeremiah chapter 20 is a man whose uh, whose theology was was secure you know, he knew what to think uh, but there was a disagreement between his head and his heart uh, so let's uh, take a look um, as we come into chapter 20 20 then and the, our first thought is simply that sometimes there are more downs than ups and, and for Jeremiah uh, there certainly were. Last time we looked at Jeremiah chapter 18 that where um, Jeremiah went to the potter and he saw clay uh, and how uh, the, the, the clay can kind of respond to, back to the potter uh, and so the potter's working the clay knows what he wants to do and the, but the, the, the clay uh, the material has a sort of response back to the potter. Uh, and the idea is that Israel, the people of God, were were, were like clay in the Lord's hands. And uh, the Lord had a plan, and that was actually for, for judgment and destruction. But if they would but re- respond with repentance, then he would change his plan uh, and make, and he wouldn't bring destruction on them. That was Jeremiah 18. Then chapter 19, uh, the clay that they had been became a fixed pot uh, of rejection against God. And that would just be smashed in their rebellion against God. Uh, the, the, the the outcome was determined and they were to be smashed and that was the end of that. Now, uh, how did that go down then with the people who were listening? So that was chapters 18 and 19. Here we are in chapter 20 and the answer is it didn't go down well, uh, which is no surprise at all. So uh, the, the verses that we, we read, just look at the first couple of verses again, straight on after that smashed pot episode. Now, Pasha, son of Inma, the uh, priest in charge of the temple of the Lord heard what Jeremiah was prophesying. So he arrested Jeremiah the prophet and had him whipped and put in stocks at the Benjamin gate of the Lord's temple. <clears throat> so it didn't go down well. In a sense, uh, Pasha was just doing his job because so far as he was concerned, Jeremiah was speaking uh, treason. Unless, obviously, Jeremiah was speaking the truth, that didn't seem to cross their minds. He was just, Pasha was taking this as uh, as treason. Uh, and Pasha himself should have heard what Jeremiah said and should have repented, but he didn't. He, he just went along with everybody else and assumed that um, uh, Jeremiah was wrong. Jeremiah, of course, knew the truth. He, he knew that he had a word from God and he was passing that on. He knew he was being tr- treated unjustly. It was so unfair. He's been put in stocks and put in prison. Uh, so then this message comes back uh, through uh, Jeremiah to Pasha. So verse six, uh, verse 3 to 6. 
Uh, the next day, when Pasha finally released him, Jeremiah said, Pasha, the Lord has changed your name. From now on, you are to be called the man who lives in terror. For this is what the Lord says. I will send terror upon you and your friends, and you will watch as they are slaughtered by the swords of the enemy. I will hand the people of Judah over to the king of Babylon. He will take them captive to Babylon or run them through with the sword. And I will uh, I will let your plunders, uh, enemies plunder Jerusalem. All the famed treasures of the city, the precious jewels and gold and silver of your kings, will be carried off to Babylon. As for you, Pasha, you and all your household will go as captives to Babylon. There you will die and be buried. You and all your friends to whom you prophesied that everything would be all right. Strong words for, for Pasha. Um, the, the, the change of name, of course, in the Old Testament uh, always reflected a change in state. Uh, this is, um, he is a changed man from this point. Uh, and we can notice as well that uh, the this is the first time that, that Babylon uh, is mentioned in, in the whole of Jeremiah's book so far. There's been this mention of judgment to come, but now it's got a name, Babylon. So um, now we know what that's called. Pasha has a new name, the, the man uh, who would... Um, who would want to punish God's messenger is now to be punished himself and the punishment is going to come through Babylon uh, and the whole event um, for poor old Jeremiah is typical of his whole life his whole ministry uh, he just went through so many um, bad experiences this unjust flogging imprisonment put in stocks so embarrassing and humiliating and so so unjust now the life and times of, of uh, Jeremiah are, are really complex um, and he was up against it for, for pretty much all his life. Um, it, it's the kind of uh, political landscape that makes something like Brexit look simple. Um, it was astonishing the range of, of things that went through. Um, what we can do I think is, is if we were to cut it right to the bone, the, the bare basics, we, there are two kings that he had significant dealings with. There were five across his uh, ministry, but there were two that really matter. Uh, and there are four key dates. There are so many incidents, but four key dates uh, really to get our, our teeth into. Um, so in, in 609 BC, uh, and obviously you have to count backwards because it's BC, um, the, the, the very good young king Josiah uh, was killed in a battle against Egypt. Uh, and... At that point, the whole of Judah came under Egyptian rule. Egypt were, were heading north to do battle against uh, the, the, the growing uh, trouble of Babylon, uh, and Josiah went out. So Josiah was killed, and, and Egypt uh, just took over Judah. Uh, and they put uh, Jehoiakim in charge as the new king. So Judah, from that point, was never again a, a sovereign, independent state. Uh, and then... So that's 609. That's quite a, a key moment. Jehoiakim uh, comes to the throne. He's placed there by uh, Egypt. 605. Now that's a, that's a year. Babylon defeated uh, uh, Egypt uh, further north, up at Carchemish, way north of Israel. And, and from that point on, uh, that was um, Egypt finished and Babylon just swept south and, and took over everybody. Uh, and they then became the, the the empire that everybody had to deal with uh, from that point on. They left Jehoiakim in, in charge. They left him in, in, in place there. Um, but they did take some of the young, uh, some of the royal family and some of the young nobles off to Babylon. And of course, Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were amongst that number who went in 605 as, as young young men. Uh, uh, now, up to that point, um, Jeremiah has been preaching. He preached. He started through uh, uh, Josiah's time, uh, uh, and he's still preaching uh, there in Jerusalem. But it was a message that people didn't want to hear. He was preaching before 605 that God was going to bring judgment, and it would be in the form of Babylon. So, um, uh, 605, for example, was, was the year that... Uh, um, Jeremiah preached the, the famous temple sermon of Jeremiah chapter 7 where he stood in the doorway of the temple and preached to all and sundry that you know what you're putting your trust in this but judgment is coming um, and at that point you were reminded that 
the whole book of Jeremiah isn't in chronological order. It's, it's a collection of, of writings and prophecies that have been brought together. Uh, 605 uh, was the date when Jehoiakim himself as king, his, his behaviour sealed the, con the fate of the whole city. Uh, and um, we'll find out more about that in chapter 36. An absolutely astonishing event. But uh, again, we'll come back to that. 605, what a year. Uh, against um, poor old Jeremiah's preaching, um, uh, everybody uh, wanted to rebel against Babylon. Certainly Jehoiakim as king wanted to rebel, and that led to a siege in 597. Uh, Jehoiakim died, his, his son took over and led for, for three months, and he did the smart thing of just, OK, let's, let's surrender, uh, which he did. Um, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar then replaced that son with Zedekiah uh, as the new king. Uh, and at that point, that's what they call the first deportation. Although uh, Daniel and some of the, the younger uh, nobility left in 605, the main exile to Babylon really began in 597, with thousands of people being taken uh, at that point. Uh, and at that point, uh, for example, the prophet Ezekiel uh, was taken. And uh, much of Ezekiel, the first half of the book of Ezekiel, uh, relates to the time of the exiles between 597 and 587 while they're there in uh, Babylon wondering uh, is Jerusalem going to be okay. Uh, Zedekiah uh, lasted 10 years and uh, he then also decided to uh, oppose Babylon with a rebellion and that was a complete and utter disaster that ended in an 18 month siege um, that was horrific uh, and it, if you want to know how horrific, read Lamentations. It's absolutely awful. Um, and then in 587, the, the, the city of Jerusalem fell uh, and was destroyed. The walls were, were, were destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Everything was taken over to Babylon and the second deportation. And only the very poorest people were left, uh, including um, Jeremiah. And we'll come back to that. So throughout all that stuff, all that stuff going on, Jeremiah was preaching for years and years and he was being opposed by Jehoiakim, by Zedekiah, by all the nobility, by everybody. And so he was just banging his head against a brick wall all the time preaching God's word. Um, so what we've seen uh, that the imprisonment by Pasha was certainly before 605, uh, before Babylon had even um, uh, taken the, the region. So, poor old Jeremiah. Now, what about us? Well, some of us have been mildly inconvenienced, it's fair to say, by um, uh, our kind of lockdown situation. Some, some of us have been much more than that. Some have suffered COVID-19. Some have uh, people in our families who've suffered COVID-19. And you felt the icy feeling of, of uh, the possibility of death, of bereavement, of... Um, of losing friends. Some of you have lost friends. And so uh, we know something of what it is to suffer in the situation that we're in. Uh, people are, many people are suffering uh, seriously. Um, and day after day you can feel the awfulness of, of what you see on the news. Even as a Christian, if your own personal life isn't touched, you still feel the pain of what you see on the news. Uh, and then as a Christian, there's, there's a tension, isn't there? You know in your head that God is in control. He is sovereign. He sits on his throne, that nothing happens in the whole universe that's outside of his knowledge or control. And you see these things and you feel a tension in your heart. You, you know, you know something in your head. But what you feel in your heart is a pain that won't go away. And, and Jeremiah knew it. Jeremiah knew what it was to have that 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 knowledge of God and a, an attention and a feeling in his heart that, that and, and there's a there's a distance so what do we do when our, our head and, and heart won't uh, don't agree uh, and that's certainly um, Jeremiah's situation so look at verse uh, 7 verse 7 and 8 uh, so carrying on then in, in Jeremiah chapter 20 uh, we come to Jeremiah's anger O oh Lord, you misled me, and I allowed myself to be misled. You are stronger than I am, 
and you overpowered me. Now I'm mocked every day, everyone laughs at me. When I speak, the words burst out, violence and destruction, I shout. So when these messages from the Lord, uh, so these messages from the Lord have made me a household joke. You see how we've had this incident with Pasha, and now what we're seeing is, is Jeremiah's own heart, and his, he's saying these things to the Lord. They're, they're angry words. Why would he say such a thing? Why would he say uh, that God's misled him? Well, back in chapter 1, God said this. God said to, to Jeremiah, Today I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some of you, uh, Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. The poor old Jeremiah, so far, his message so far has only been violence and destruction. You know, he's only had this um, uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow part of his appointment. He's still waiting for the, uh, you know, the, the build up and plant stuff. And in fact, where we are, you know, before 605, everyone's just in denial. Um, he's being mocked. He's, oh, Jeremiah, he's the manic street preacher, isn't he? Hey, Jeremiah, what's new today? Oh, right, death and destruction. Yeah, great. He's a joke. But where's the build up and plant stuff? You know, there's no pleasure in his work. Some some Christians can have a sense of that. You know, you can know what it's like to, to feel part of a church. You're passing on God's message of salvation for years and years, but no one's ever saved. Lord, what, what's going on? Uh, maybe we should just give up. Poor old Jeremiah was tempted to give up. Maybe he should. Say nothing. Just quit. Just, okay. Zip. I'm not. I'm just not going to say any more. But he couldn't do it. He couldn't keep it up. Uh, verse 9. But if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak his name, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I'm worn out trying to keep it in. I can't do it. I'm trying to hold it in, I can't do it. God told uh, Jeremiah back in chapter 5 that uh, his words would be uh, like fire in Jeremiah's mouth that would consume the people. Um, so when Jeremiah shut his mouth, that fire that was in his mouth was what began to kind of burn him. It was a, a fire in his body. It had to come out. He had to speak out. Uh, of course, there's a challenge there, isn't there? Because Revelation makes it clear. Revelation uses that image for the church. The church is also to speak fire. Uh, we're to be witnesses with the fire of the gospel going out into the world. And, and so the, the first challenge is, does it? And the second challenge is, if it doesn't, does it feel like a burning inside that, you know, you just can't, you're, you want to speak out, but you're unable to for some reason? Or maybe the fire's just gone out and you've lost the whole desire to speak God's word into a lost and broken world. Goodness, the world needs that good news. And maybe the fire in your heart's even going out. That's a bit of a challenge. Anyway, right, so verse 10 um, makes it clear that even Jeremiah's friends are against him. You know, everybody's against him. There's a, an anger in his heart. Uh, and it still has to speak, but he's so angry with God. But you've got that anger in his heart, but you've also got an assurance in his head. Uh, verses 11 to 13. And this is his, his theology, which is as strong as ever. That the Lord stands beside me like a great warrior. Before him, my persecutors will stumble. They cannot defeat me. They will fall and be thoroughly humiliated. Their dishonour will never be forgotten. O Lord of heaven's armies, you test those who are righteous. You examine the deepest thoughts and secrets. Let me see your vengeance against them, for I have committed my cause to you. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For though I was poor and needy, he rescued me from my oppressors. What a thing to say. It's so at odds with the verses that just went before it. He knows that God is, is righteous and powerful and sovereign and ready to judge. He knows that God will bring judgment against the people that have been persecuting Jeremiah. The very judgment that God has promised, he knows God is going to bring that. Jeremiah's humiliation is going to be transferred to the very people who've been humiliating him. And he can even praise God and, and, and encourage other people to do the same. Sing to the Lord, praise to the Lord. But then we, you, know, you look at Jeremiah as a, as a whole man, 
uh, and he's 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 kind of confused, isn't he? He's, his head is this unshakable knowledge of God's power, his righteousness, his justice, and his heart is is a broken mess of emotion. He lives in the real world of opposition, rejection, and hurt, and there's this tension. And, and Jeremiah is angry with God, even while he's being assured of God's sovereignty. So how does he resolve it? This is the <laughs> because we we know something of this, don't we? In our own times, we we know God is in control, and yet we feel this tension, this anxiety of of COVID nineteen, of our society, of our broken world. How, how do we how do we resolve those two? It turns out Jeremiah isn't our role model. He doesn't do very well. So let, let's take a look at the next um, verses. Verse fourteen. He falls into self-pity, into despair. He says this, I, I curse the day I was born. May no one celebrate the day of my birth. I curse the messenger who told my father, good news, you have a son. Let him be destroyed like the cities of old, like the, thrall, the, the, the Lord overthrew without mercy. Terrify him all day long with battle shouts because he did not kill me at birth. Oh, that I had died in my mother's womb, that her body had been my grave. Why was I ever born? My entire life has been filled with trouble, sorrow and shame. They're astonishing words. It might remind you a little bit of Job chapter 3, when Job is in his darkest hour. These are really dark corners of the Bible. These are men in terribly dark places. But calamity came on Job for reasons he didn't understand. Calamities come on Jeremiah for reasons he understands all too well. Jeremiah wasn't suffering for disobedience. Of course, Job wasn't. That was something else. But uh, there's no sense that Jeremiah is suffering for disobedience, uh, like uh, Jonah, perhaps. He knows he is suffering because he's been fully obedient to God. Uh, we saw in the last time how uh, Jeremiah's uh, prayers, Jeremiah 15, we saw his prayers aren't always role models for us. And, he, and here he is. Why was I ever born? My entire life has been filled with trouble, sorrow and shame there, verse 18. Why was I ever born? Well, you, Jeremiah, yeah, that is your life. Your, your life has been filled with trouble and sorrow and shame. Uh, and even when he wrote that, it, it, it would continue to be for many years. Uh, and there are many Christians who feel the same, frankly, burdens and griefs that you have to live with for years. Perhaps unsolvable, unfixable griefs for now. And why was I ever born? Well, you might not ask that. Some Christians do. But your question might be, why was I born like this? Why was I born into this family, into this place? Why was I born in this way? Why, why is it always me? Why do some people seem to have it easy? And for me, every day seems to be a struggle. Why, why Lord? And, and you can call that a pity party, and for some people it is, who wallow in self-pity, you know, when perhaps they ought not. But often the pain is very real. And even the self-pity can be reasonable when, when we think about it. Jeremiah actually did know the answer to his question. For Jeremiah to say, why was I ever born, is quite odd really, because we've already seen the answer to that question. In the book of Jeremiah, actually in chapter 1, Jeremiah 1 verse 5, God said to Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. That's what God said to him. Why was I ever born? You were appointed. That's true for you as well, you see. The Lord could say to you, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you for what? I appointed you for something, to such times as these. I appointed you to the condition that you have, to the family that you're in, to the friends that you have. I appointed you. You didn't choose uh, the times that you're in. You didn't choose to be going through a, a time of COVID-19 
grief. Don't go comparing yourself to others. Don't go comparing yourself to the lives of others because this is the life that God has appointed you to. So are you going to wallow in, in, in self-pity, in misery, or look around in the situation that you are in and say, well, the Lord has appointed me to this. Jeremiah didn't like it. You might not be entirely happy either. Right? Does that really help? Is there still is there a way for us to to harness mind and heart when they seem to be against each other? Well, okay, I understand God's sovereignty, but you know what? This still hurts. I'm still in a rubbish situation here. We need a better example than Jeremiah, don't we? That, that it, wallowing the way he did. And of course, there is a better example. Jesus shows us how to suffer and serve. How to suffer in service. Did Jeremiah speak an unpopular message? Yes, so did Jesus. Did powerful people plot Jeremiah's downfall? Yes, as they did for Jesus. Did he know pain and rejection and suffering? Yes, of course both men did. But Jesus knew them long before he reached the cross. Look back at uh, verse 10 again. Verse 10, I have heard the many rumours about me. They call me the man who lives in terror. They threaten, if you say anything, we will report it. Even my old friends are watching me, waiting for a fatal slip. Doesn't Judas spring to mind? The people closest to Jesus let him down. In Jeremiah's self-pity, um, he wished he'd never been born. He'd, he'd rather have died than get on with the mission that God had sent him to do. Jesus knew that to die was itself the very mission that God had sent him to do. So Jesus was clear about his theology and about his mission. His, his head clearly was in the right place. What about his heart? To see his heart really exposed, well, we go to Gethsemane, don't we? What did he say there? He said, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. He prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. He prayed a second time. My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. Luke 22 tells us this. He prayed more fervently. And he was in such agony of spirit that sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. One, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter tells us this. God called you to, be, to do good, even if it means suffering. Well, that sounds a bit odd. Just as Christ suffered for you. Uh, he is your example. And you must follow in his steps. See, Jesus approached his suffering with his head and his heart in the right place, actually aligned. So he is your example, says Peter. You must follow in his steps. What are, what are the steps? How, how can we align these things? See, Jeremiah knew God's sovereignty in his head, but he felt the pain of carrying out, um, carrying out those appointed tasks in his heart. And it drove him to despair actually even to sin against God in the things that he said. Jesus also knew the sovereignty of God in his head. He felt greater pain of carrying out his appointed task in his heart. But it didn't drive him to despair. It drove him to the Father. It drove him to prayer. It drove him to pray for his enemy's forgiveness. It drove him to submission to the Father's will. And submission is very much an act of, of heart of will. To say your will be done, as Jesus did in Gethsemane, it's a massive prayer. It's to submit your thoughts and your hopes and your emotions to God's will. It's to surrender your bitterness that you feel that the world the world is not as you hoped it would be, you, and you're bitter and you're distraught and you're angry about that, you're submitting, submitting even that 
to the to the will of the Father. You you're giving up being despondent on life because well this is what's been appointed to me by God and I'm going to go with that. It's to redirect the the energy of self-absorption into the will and purpose of God. And we're combining our knowledge and our will in submission to God. And we bring the two together. And Jesus is our example in Gethsemane. So gather your head and your heart together and before your Father in heaven. And then you put one foot in front of the other and you rise up to the life he has appointed you to, in the days he has appointed you for, in the broken world he has appointed you in, and we do his will. Is that easy? It wasn't easy for Jesus, but he is still our great example, and he is the one that we go to for help. What a high priest he is. We're going to sing our final hymn. Let's, uh, the words again will be on the screen. So let's sing together. <laughs> present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, if you're with us here on uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, it would be good to catch up uh, over a coffee if you want to put the kettle on. We will see you on Zoom in a few minutes. Details on the website. See you shortly.